can say anything and everything. Hey there, welcome to the Compare To Podcast. I'm Heather Creekmore, and I'm really glad that you are watching or listening today because today my friend Ronnie is on our show. Let me tell you just a little bit about her. Ronnie Rock weaves themes of transformative hope and grace-filled leadership into everything she shares on the page and on the stage. She's an award-winning marketing executive who travels around the world to gather words and images that inspire others to action with Orphan Outreach, a global nonprofit dedicated to serving the orphaned and vulnerable. Ronnie offers battle-tested wisdom about leadership, advocacy marketing, and finding God in the most beautiful and painful of circumstances. She and her husband live in the Texas Hill Country, just right Right down the street from me. And that's why I am glad to introduce you today to my friend, Ronnie Rock. Ronnie, thanks for being on the show. I am so glad to be here. I am so glad to see your face and to hear your voice. And if we were just sitting at the table with each other, it'd be perfect. And soon. We'll get to soon. do that soon. Yes. Soon. Yes, I hope soon. <sighs> These masks, they're driving me crazy <laughs> too. But I don't uh, you know what? Political I, have by that. Just, <laughs> I have just, I have, I have realized, uh, well, first of all, I have a really good variety of masks now. Mm -hmm. So I feel like they, they're color coordinated because I always love a pop of color. But I've also realized I, if I call, if I think of them as a blanket fort, Mm. and I just become a kid like in a blanket fort mm. then all of a sudden I don't know the edge is, is taken off and then like I'm walking around with my little blanket fort on and I can look around and see everything but nobody really knows what's going on inside <laughs> so very nice there yeah there you go I mean I figure it's saving me on lipstick like at some level, I'm not having I to wear lipstick as much. I still put on, I still put on lipstick. It's a thing. And it just it's sticks to thing. the inside of your mask then? It does. It does have like little lip prints on every mask. And, <laughs> but fun. I know inside in my blanket fort, I'm mm -hmm. stunning. There you go. <laughs> right. Well, today, Ronnie and I are going to talk about her new book. And that's your little teaser. It's called One Woman Can Change the World. And we're going to get there. But before we do, Ronnie, would you just tell us a little bit more about you? Who, who is Ronnie Rock? I don't know. When you read my bio, I'm like, I need to get to know that woman. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's a, it's a strange thing when uh -huh. other people say things about you. You go, oh, she's kind of cool. And then you're like, oh, wait, that's me. No, she's not. She's not cool. Um, <laughs> Gosh, let's see. Well, first and foremost, this is an important thing. I am a woman, uh, even though my name is Ronnie, and I have gotten plenty of friends in trouble over the years when they say, I'm going to go hang out with Ronnie, or I'm going to go spend the weekend with Ronnie, and then they're like, who's Ronnie? <laughs> no, no, funny. no, it's Ronnie, it's Ronnie, and it is short for Veronica. So I'm a woman, I am, uh, I'm a daughter, I'm a sister, I am, I am an orphan. Both my parents have passed away, and um, gosh, that even factors into a little bit into my book mm -hmm. and into some future things that I'm writing. Um, let's see, I'm, I'm married. I am a mom. I am a Gigi to the two, two coolest grandkids, which I know every grandparent says <laughs> are the best, but I do have it on good authority that <laughs> mine are pretty stellar. Uh, and I am a trusted lap to Pearl, the very sassy rescue pup. Mm. Yeah. What and, kind of, uh, do you know what kind Pearl is or what's her, well, her mix? She, uh, we got her out of foster care and we know that her mom was a schnauzer. Okay. But unfortunately we don't know the, the, the dark troubled story behind mm. how Pearl came to be. I personally want to get a DNA test done because I want to know what's in there. And my husband laughs at me. Uh-huh. <laughs> But my, uh, my son and his wife just got their DNA test done on the dog that they thought was a golden doodle, only to find out that Dax has no doodle in there. <laughs> huh. No, and no golden. He's, he's neither. He's everything. He is everything but what they thought he was. But, you so know, that, now that, I'm curious. Now I yeah. want to know what Pearl is. Yeah. That's so funny. I have friends here in Austin that got a golden doodle, which is actually a golden border collie. <laughs> <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> you know, but at the end of the day, really what you what you want a dog for is just because they love you all the time yeah. and get excited even when you go out to the mailbox. They're mm -hmm. just so happy to see you and they ask no questions. Mm -hmm. Which during this whole time, this weird season that we're in, 
I, I it's okay. It is okay. <laughs> just have somebody who just loves you unconditionally mm -hmm. and will Absolutely. chase you around. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. I'm just hoping that my little bucket of unconditional love doesn't keep clawing at the door behind me <laughs> like she was a minute ago. <laughs> so we'll, we'll see if we can make it through without that happening. Uh, they're well. needy little buckets. <laughs> well, Ronnie, you're yeah. on the Compare to Who show. So we talk about comparison here. Mm. So tell me, the million dollar question is, have you ever struggled with comparison? <laughs> when you told me you were going to ask me that question, I did you know, there's the whole lol thing, which for whatever reason, I think laugh out loud and I automatically hear LOL and I'm like, uh -huh. lol. I don't know, <laughs> but I, I'm literally actively legitimately laughed out loud because comparison is, it is, it is built into the wiring of mm -hmm. us. And I think especially women, mm -hmm. especially women living in cultures like ours in the mm -hmm. U S I will say that the, many of the women that are in the book are in cultures where comparison finds itself in other ways, as opposed to, um, just the beast of comparison that we have in the U S mm -hmm. um, the comparison of there's always, right? I'm either too young or too old. I don't live in the right city. I don't have the right shade of skin. I don't have the right amount of education. If we're single, we think that there's a, def a default in it or some sort of defect because we think that no one wants us. If we're married, we start to think about, oh, but things would have been so easier when we're always, our eyes are always so easily diverted mm -hmm. to anything that might uh, disqualify us. Mm -hmm. And I think that there are those days that we're strong enough, right? That you do, you kind of muster and you're able to, um, to ward off that perpetual voice of the enemy who I, I liken to a squirrel. Cause I'm mm -hmm. like, he is like a squirrel and a bird feeder and he has nothing else to do. <laughs> bird feet is not his. He has no right. He's not a bird, mm -hmm. but he is going to try every day to steal the bird feet. And he has, cause he has nothing else to do. Mm -hmm. And so that constant accusation of you are just a little too little, too much, too mm -hmm. old, too whatever it hits us. And there are days that you are able, right. To like, hold up the shield and the gauntlet and say, mm. not today. Thank you. I'm fine. And then there are other days that it's just, you're weary or you're tired or you have anything could mm. cause it. Right. And, um, and then it's easy to lean in and go, yeah, you know, you might be right. Mm. And so have I ever struggled with it? Absolutely. Um, gosh, even in launching this book, during this season, if anybody would have said, Ronnie, make your sweet list of all the cool things you want to have happen when you launch a book into the world, a book mm -hmm. that a publisher has invested mm -hmm. in. It's not just you. A lot of people are cheering for this book. What do you want to have on that list of all the cool things that could happen? A global pandemic with a cultural pandemonium would not have mm -hmm. even made the list. <laughs> And so even that, and it was very easy to look around and go, well, God, if it just launched a week later, mm -hmm. if it launched three months earlier, or if only the people who had influence would pay attention to me versus paying attention to the issues that are surrounding our country. And there's so mm -hmm. many feelings where you can say, I just, clearly I'm not qualified to do this. I am not qualified to have a voice to do ministry, mm -hmm. to parent well, to do my job well. So many things can get us. It's happening right now. I know in homes around the country, as parents try to make sense of what you do with school mm -hmm. and everybody has an opinion and everybody is questioning and it's very easy for a parent who doesn't have one option that another parent has to sit and start looking and saying, well, clearly I'm going to fail because I've never homeschooled before. Mm. Well, clearly I'm going to fail because um, my school system doesn't offer the same things. And those indictments against us, man, they mm. stack up quickly. But 
And, and again, they're in every way. And the thing is, nothing is new under the sun. Mm -hmm. They were there in Eden. Mm -hmm. That temptation, I don't think, and I talk about it in my book, that I don't think that sin just burst onto the hmm. scene as soon as Eve took whatever fruit it was mm -hmm. <laughs> and took a big bite. I don't mm -hmm. think, I think that sin was given birth. That thing that says, and it's not just doing bad, right? It's also the things that we don't do as well as the things that we do, but it really is setting our sights on anything but trusting God. Yeah. And that was, I think that that was, that birth that was given its seeds for growth. As soon as they started looking outside the borders of mm -hmm. Eden and going, hmm, maybe we don't have all that we need. Maybe mm -hmm. there is more, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. um, but we we do that, and in doing that, we deny our own identity. Mm -hmm. And I wish I could tell you, I wish I could tell you that this book that you're going to read has all the simple answers in it. <laughs> it's a three, te three step solution. And you just got to, you know, I don't know. Do you use these two things that you do every day and uh, you're going to be solved. <laughs> it's going to be solved. But I'm honest in that book. I still, I still, it's a part of my life. Do I struggle with it? Yeah, there are some days I struggle with it. Other days, is it a nuisance? Absolutely. Yeah. Am I cognizant of it? You better believe it. And yeah. do I think that it'll exist probably until I breathe my last? Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah absolutely. But, yeah, it's, it was interesting that you had the Adam and Eve story in your book as well, because I, my my new book, The Burden of Better, I I mentioned that as well. Just yeah. that Adam and Eve had everything. Mm -hmm everything and they still thought it could be a little better like, I'm just a go tiny just, bit just better. A better yeah they, i mean <laughs> come on they had they actually had this world that was created for them mm -hmm. right and right. god being as brilliant and creative as he is he designed everything in this incredible way that does marry science if you ever want to look at the earth check out the order in which it's written in genesis brilliant stuff and it gets it all ready so that humanity can live on it gets it all together so humanity can live on it then he gives birth to humanity he calls us his pride and joy says that it is very very good looks at both man and woman says now you know what here you go here you go and then all he asks us to do is hold his hand and walk with mm -hmm. him in the cool of the afternoon and have really good conversations about life and just live life with him. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't know what they were thinking. <laughs> it just, yeah, it, it is. I don't it's know what they but then again, I don't yeah. know what I'm thinking half the time when I do something and then I look back and I go, well, that's dumb. <laughs> what were you thinking? So, but they, for whatever reason, saw that as being just a little bit, less than what could be amazing. Yeah. And then of course, and the beauty of it all is that God, that invitation is still there today, right? Nothing has right. changed in his viewpoint of right. us and Eden. He still wanted to just hold our hand yeah. and live life and talk about life and have great conversations and trust him. So, yeah. Yeah. but then anytime, right? That little trust gets a little off. Well, because it's the same lie, right? The same lie, the same lie that God doesn't want you to have it awesome. He just wants you to have it like good at this level. But this other thing would take you to, you know, well, I would call it better, uh, <laughs> but, yeah. but to no, this next level. World. And and God's yeah. like, God's keeping you back from stuff. And it's like, oh, we, we fall for it. But yeah, yeah, I was always like, I'm going to be, I'm the queen of, I'm the queen of not quite. <laughs> Right. You're like, oh, my, my world could be really perfect if, uh -huh. but it's not. Mm -hmm. um, instead of saying, no, you know what? This life that I have been given, this space that I have been given, this time on earth that I have been given is pretty great stuff. Mm -hmm. and, um, and do I, um, is it perfect? No, mm -hmm. because you know what? Things are things are messed up. They, mm -hmm. they are there. It's not a perfect world, 
but um, but this life can be lived fully in the midst of brokenness, in the midst of pain. Mm-hmm. Can I learn every day from both those things that go well and then those things that I utterly fall on my face? <laughs> yeah, I can. Mm-hmm. I really can. And can I, be, can I serve someone else? Can my life, um, can I become the person that helps bolster someone else and they can bolster me as we walk this journey? That's a pretty sweet, this is a pretty sweet gig. Mm -hmm. It really is. I love that. And that's a perfect segue to your book because you're telling the stories of of women that are are, are just living lives, but in a pretty spectacular way. So I don't want to steal the thunder. Tell us, tell us in your words, like what, what, what should we expect from this book? One woman can change the world. Oh, well, I mentioned earlier, if you are, it is a, it is definitely, it's a book about leaders, but it is not a typical leadership book. So if what you're hoping for is that you're going to grab this book, that sounds kind of brazen. One woman can change the world. <laughs> sounds kind of bootstrappish and I'll show you. And if you're expecting a book that has quick tips in it, um, or ways to schedule out your bullet journal better, it's not going to give you that. What it does is it reminds you of who you were always created to be, both through scripture and through the lives of women that I have honestly been honored to have worked alongside over the past decade. And women that when I first met them, my goal was to try to help fix them and to try to help fix the worlds that they were living in Mm. and what they ended up teaching me was so much more about the journey of faith and about the importance of long road walking with others. What they taught me were things about who we are as women, our strength Mm -hmm. that is, and these are all divine things that God provides us in the way he has literally wired women and crafted Mm -hmm. women the way that we can, can uh, the way that we walk through trials is different mm-hmm. than the way a man walks through trials. The way we actually physically see is different. The way we can blend facts and feelings together is different. Our voices, the emotion that we feel, the intuitiveness that we have. And so again, just walking the road with these women who you would never meet because none of them have blue verified check marks next Mm -hmm. to their name. None of them are on national platforms, Mm -hmm. but they are all voices that when amplified, remind us of the character and qualities that God has created in us. So what I really hope when women read the book is that they for the first time, get to exhale just a little bit, Mm. to realize that God is not a bully with a carrot in one stick and a baseball bat in the other Mm. that is teasing you to say, oh, here it is, my perfect will. Can you find it? Can you find it? Mm. Oh, you missed it. Bam. Right? Mm -hmm. He is not a jerk. In fact, one of the the titles, one of the chapter titles is God is not a jerk. Mm. And so often we view him in this role or this, this mindset that somehow he's just slightly perturbed at us Mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. Even though we may say, Oh no, he's a God of grace and things, the way we treat ourselves, Mm -hmm. the way we view the world around us, the way we even view our ability to actually step into the world of someone else Mm -hmm. and make a difference. We still it's so easy for us to see God as just being annoyed at us that if we just would get it right, it would be Mm -hmm. okay. Instead of him being a loving father who calls us the apple of his eye and who continues to believe that our story is worth investing in. Mm -hmm. And so um, I just, man, that's, I pray that it's, it is some fresh, like just some kind of fresh wind in some lungs of women to let them see that they don't have to, they don't have to travel to the ends of the earth. They don't have to have a degree. They don't have to do all of the things that they think 
will somehow qualify them mm. to be good enough to minister. That they are ministers, just mm. their character and qualities that they have are valuable and and um, purposeful yeah. in the eyes of God. Yeah. Okay. So I'm glad you said that word purposeful because I know you have some strong opinions on Me? the whole. No. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't put this on your questions, but I want to go here and I, I yeah. probably should have given you a heads up, but, but I know you, you talk, well, I think you use the term purpose weary. Mm -hmm. Um, Flesh that out because I know when you and I have talked that I felt a little like, oh, am I using that word in the word in the way that <laughs> Ronnie means is not good. Um, but I, I I love I love the concept there. So talk to me. What what do you mean by purpose weary? Okay. And f flesh that out a little. Sure. And what I, I what I say is that I offer real hope for purpose weary warriors. Um, and I am speaking even though I do well prior to prior to the pause that mm -hmm. we are all living in, I travel internationally. So um, I, I do have friends around the world, but I am who I am and I am was born and raised in the United States. And so this is the culture that I understand. I understand a, an American culture as folks say it, but I say it's the United States culture um, which is very performance driven. Mm -hmm. It is very much based on success metrics. In fact, Lisa, who's one of the women in the book talks about it. She has a, um, a ministry to teen moms and their babies. And she talks about it all the time. She left the banking industry and she goes, everything was metrics driven. And now I'm in a world that it's not metrics driven. If somebody asks me, how long is it going to be until a teen mom has hope? Hmm. And she's like, how much time are you going to invest in her life? Because hmm. we are so driven by metrics. If you think about it um, in church culture, we're like, oh, fastest growing, biggest. Mm -hmm. We love those big, explosive just in your face, bigger, better, brighter, bolder mm -hmm. adjectives. And so in our world, then we start thinking, unless my purpose is bigger, better, brighter, bolder, I have to figure out what that purpose is. And I've got it. And then I have to know what God's purpose is for my life. I have to know. And we treat it as if it is like the center ring of a target mm -hmm. and that we've got to hit it with laser accuracy. And if we don't, then we're forever going to be kind of limping along, mm -hmm. just thinking that, well, I was, I, I was trying to be in God's perfect will, but somehow I only made it to his permissive will, which just, that's not in scripture, <laughs> but we use it a whole lot mm -hmm. of the, I've got to be in God's perfect will as if somehow if we're in his perfect will, everything is going to go swimmingly mm. and everything is going to grow exponentially. And we're going to have some really cool metrics to show mm. for it. And it is exhausting mm. because we find out really quickly that there is no three-step solution to the relationship, our relationship with God. Mm. And there is no three-step plan to true transformational leadership mm. because it's not transactional. It is a relational thing. Mm -hmm. And so what I hope is to remind everybody that God's purpose is not a tiny dot on a bullseye. <laughs> he does, his purpose is not for you to have the one job or live in only the one place mm -hmm. and do only the one thing. All of you who are watching or listening, I guarantee you, you're doing more than one thing. Mm -hmm right? And so we just get panicked because we're thinking, oh, I'm supposed to do the one thing to the exclusion of the other things. But what mm -hmm. is the one thing? Yeah. And then we find out that no, God's his, it's bigger than that. He promises that he sets our feet on a broad place. Mm -hmm. He is a creative God. He created mm -hmm. the, you know, he spoke stars and then he created us in his image and likeness. So I have a feeling that he actually designed us to be creative and to do, be mm -hmm. able to do more than one thing. Yeah. 
Yeah. And to be able to walk through seasons of life and watch how he is additive in our stories mm -hmm. and he doesn't waste a piece of our past mm -hmm. on our present and he's not going to waste this season, even this weird season mm -hmm. where we're all still trying to figure out what normal even looks mm -hmm. like. I promise you this season where nothing feels like it's gone according to plan, he is not wasting it. It mm -hmm. will not be squandered. He is a useful God. He's a pretty practical God mm -hmm. yeah. and he will take this to continue your journey. Yeah. And so when I talk about purpose weary, it is not because I don't like the word purpose. I think I love the word purpose. I worry that we set it up as being that there has to be this purpose in our life. And the only way to judge if we are really living mm -hmm. that purpose is by the success that mm -hmm. we see instead of by seeing the transformation that happens mm -hmm. over time. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. No, that's great. That's really good. And I, I totally agree with everything. I mean, especially I'm glad you, I'm glad you mentioned seasons because I feel like that is so important, important, especially like for those of you that are listening or watching that have young kids at home mm -hmm. and you're like, uh, okay, I know that motherhood is part of my purpose, but you know, maybe this was my cry. Like, Oh God, is this all there is? <laughs> like, Am I ever going to get past sippy cups? And body training and all the things, you know, and, yeah. and recognizing that, I mean, it's, you know, it, it is, it is beautiful, maybe more so in retrospect than when you're going yeah. through it, how God does weave together those threads from those seasons. So one other thing I thought of, and I share this with friends who are discontent in their careers all the time, but my, um, I worked on Capitol Hill and the, my least favorite part of my job was doing the bookkeeping. I am horrible Ooh. with That's math and numbers and that is not my thing, but they added it to my job and I was like, oh. well, you know, the next job I applied for, which was my dream job, the only reason I was qualified for it was because I had that experience mm -hmm. in doing that bookkeeping. It, when it, again, it was a small part of that second job, but that was what set me apart from the other candidates. And mm -hmm. I just remember at that time stopping and thinking, like, thank you, God. Like that, that part of my journey yeah. that I was like, I can't believe I've got a job where I have to do this. It was like that, you know, God knew what he was doing and, and how, mm -hmm. you know, it just, he does weave the tapestry of, of our he, lives in a beautiful way. He does. And he, again, he just doesn't squander things. Mm -hmm. And there are folks that are like, no, my job right now is this, and this is all I can focus on. And I would encourage you to look at what's being cultivated. Mm -hmm. You may see, if you're a mom, you may see that your job is cleaning up Cheerios <laughs> and finding hidden Legos with your foot mm -hmm. in carpet and just cleaning the, there's a meme that's going around like, I clean the kitchen, I cook so I can clean the kitchen, so I can cook, so I can clean the kitchen. <laughs> um, but I promise you, underneath activities that you may even think are mundane, mm -hmm. underneath that, qualities and attributes are being bubbled up about just the way you view those things, how you solve problems, how mm -hmm. you view challenges, how you respond. All of those things are a part of your design and a part of your design that works now and will work in the future and will be shaped and molded. I have ampersands. If anybody ever comes to my house, you're going to see, <laughs> and I have a thing for ampersands. And I like the big ones that do all the curves. Uh -huh. And the reason why I love the ampersands is because of the, what ampersand stands for, which means, and in itself. And when you put an ampersand between things, you have what if like if it was the Heather and Ronnie show and we had an ampersand then we'd know they'd be fully Heather and fully Ronnie mm -hmm. and then they'd be together and be great. And I really believe that God is an ampersand God. He takes the seasons of our lives. Mm -hmm. He takes the celebrations and the chaos and he puts ampersands in there mm -hmm. to show that all of those things have meaning and fullness in and of themselves. And then together they are strengthened over time. My mom, when my father passed away, my mom looked at me and said, I have no value. Mm -hmm. All I have done my entire life is cook and clean and care for people. 
I don't have any value. Mm. I didn't go to school. I didn't get a degree. I did. I can't even drive a car. She just laid out the allegations against herself of the value that she said she didn't have because what she thought she had done in her life as not only a mom and a grandparent, but she was also a caregiver to uh, my dad's parents who were both mm -hmm. very ill. And then my dad in his later years, because of alcoholism and prescription drug abuse, she took care of him. She ended up becoming an in-home health care person. Hmm. But it was her having to re-look at yeah. what she had learned over time yeah. and not looking at cooking a meal as cooking a meal, but looking at cooking a meal as providing nutrition and care for somebody. Mm -hmm. And I think far too often we look at, we look at the spreadsheet, right? Mm -hmm. We look at, and go, I hate accounting. Mm -hmm. I don't want to do accounting. Accounting is horrible, which I'm also a horrible accounting person. <laughs> and I'm thankful that other people, that they I love that stuff. But you know what? I learned it and mm -hmm. I, and I can, and it has helped me over time mm -hmm. in the work that I do. I work in orphan care now. There's a whole lot of numbers involved in orphan care. There's a lot of, in, in order to be able to explain what's true about orphan care, you also have to know what's, you have to be able to discern those numbers that are not real in orphan care. And so I'm thankful mm -hmm. that um, that time, maybe I didn't like, I didn't like um, accounting, mm -hmm. but it taught me to be more analytical and, and think more um, critically yeah, and study a little bit more and watch things a little bit more. So I'm thankful for that. I yeah. still wouldn't want to be an accountant and neither you wouldn't want me to be one either. Ooh, but me neither. I am. <laughs> But I'm thankful. I'm thankful because, yeah. yeah. Well, hey, let's go back to your mom's story because that's kind of interesting to me. Yeah. Because I, when I work with women one on one, one big thing I notice is a lot of women that are stuck in body image and comparison issues don't have have kind of similar feelings or say similar things to what your mom said. And in some ways, it's like their body image, because a lot of women with body image issues, you know, I, I think it's, it's, I always hate to generalize, but a lot of women with body image issues grew up being told that they were very pretty, went through high school and college being told that they were pretty, being valued for their beauty, mm -hmm. and they hit age 40, age 50, whenever aging starts to set in, when menopause sets in, and they no longer have that in the same way. And they stop and they say similar things to me like your mom said, like, I don't have any value. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I'm not hot anymore. I mm -hmm. don't do anything. Maybe I raised some kids. Maybe I've got, you know, but, and, and they're lost. And so mm -hmm. one of the things we do is we kind of talk about like, okay, well, what are some things that, you know, you're, you like to do? Mm -hmm. Have you taken a spiritual gifts assessment? That kind of thing. But fill that out for me a little bit more, because I think, I think that's an interesting place to go just in terms of how, as a, as a leadership consultant, how would you help a woman figure out like part of, you know, see, I feel bad. I was about to say figure out her purpose. And then I was like, Oh, that's too pigeonholed. I can't say that. <laughs> so now I'm tongue tied. You know <laughs> I use the term. I actually use the term, um, discovering your design. Okay. Uh, okay. It's not I'm just about that. purpose. It is, it is looking at the way you are crafted mm -hmm. and then what, what are all the ways that that might play out? Um, and I will tell you, I am not, there's it's not like I have a certificate on the wall. Yeah. <laughs> I have plenty of friends that are life coaches and they are certified and it's all good. Um, but because, through being in leadership roles, through walking the road, the long road, and then um, providing coaching for up and coming um, folks, there are some things that I have learned over time, questions that I've had to ask myself. So I don't ask anybody to do anything that I haven't mm -hmm. asked uh, myself to do or have gone through it. I think one of the things that you just shared is a great thing. I am, I am an assessment junkie. Mm -hmm. I really am. And, and it's not because I'm trying to find some deep, dark secret. In fact, on my website, you can find it's 15 questions that you can ask yourself to help 
to help un uncover your design. And I laugh. I have some women that are doing it right now. And I go, I'm going to, I'm just going to spoiler alert right now. It's not like a Buzzfeed quiz where it's going to come back and tell you that you're a rainbow pig. It isn't. <laughs> There's no color associated with it or anything. They're thought starter questions mm -hmm. for you really to spend some good time in conversation with the Lord and with yourself. And so assessments like a spiritual gifts assessment mm -hmm. is a beautiful thing to do and to do it not in light of the job that you may have mm -hmm. or the role that you may have, but just that gut level response of how you feel. Are you, you know, how do you respond when there's pain around you? What is your natural inclination when you see a problem? So I encourage and one, I make a big old long list and I even have, which I can send to you and you can add. I did an entire article for a, a digital magazine for 20 something leaders. Like here are 12 different assessments that you can take that are great. Some that you've heard of, some that you've not. And it's everything from career assessments to map, which aligns the way you process and think in your natural talents with the best kind of job that you might have. It does have, um, it does have a, a real thorough spiritual gifts assessment um, quiz that's, or assessment that's included. Enneagrams in there, Myers-Briggs is included, Strengths Finders, they're all in there. And it's not that those things are going to give you the absolute answers, but what they do help you do is in just learn a little bit more about your personality or the way, how you view problems. So I think that is, that's one way getting pigeonholed in that and labeling yourself to say, hi, I'm Ronnie, the four wing three, try to four, seven, nine is not <laughs> the way to go. I'm Ronnie. And the Enneagram's in there, but all this stuff is in there, but to, to, if you label yourself or box yourself, that's not healthy, but it does help you get to know yourself a little sure. bit better. And then asking yourself questions about dreams that you had as a child that still mm -hmm. kind of bubble up. Who do you actually like to be around? Who gives you energy? Who drains you? What kind of circumstances give you energy and what drain you? Where is your attention naturally drawn? Some of them are just really basic questions just to help you understand go oh you know what that is right mm -hmm. i really do i always when i look at this, this challenge i am always compelled to mm -hmm. fill in the blank those things may not tell you that you're going to be the best accountant in the world <laughs> there are those assessments to do that but what um, the questions do is help you say oh you know what i'm more wired i am kind of wired i am crafted to like me, if a, something troubles me, I am apt to speak about it. Mm -hmm. I have other friends that if they're troubled by something, they are apt to carry it on their backs mm -hmm. and some fall onto their knees in prayer. We're all designed differently because we're all parts of a very beautiful body of Christ. Um, I have always been a storyteller, can't not be. And those are things, there are other folks that see when they think things, it's more analytical in nature. Mm. Some folks are more words based, but all of those things are all just pieces of the way you're wired that will then play into when you're a mom, because you'll, you'll watch them. You'll go, oh, wow, I do that as a mom. And I do that as a wife. And I do that as a friend. I have those same responses. And so that's what I normally do. Even when I'm trying to help somebody with something as simple as a resume, mm -hmm. I won't say, what, it, what did you do? Mm -hmm. I will say, what did you know? What mm -hmm. did you learn? What transformation did you see over time? What talents did you use? Because then you can even bridge gaps in resumes mm -hmm. where somebody says, well, I was just a wife. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't work. And you're like, oh yeah, you did. Oh, yeah, you did? Let's talk about the qualities that you used. Let's talk about the talents that you used during that season where you may not have been earning a paycheck, mm -hmm. but you were still very much engaged in 
transformate uh, transformative care you were still very much engaged in management mm -hmm. all of those things those things don't die on a vine if you step away for a while they don't die on a vine if you get laid off things just don't stop yeah. those talents are still there and so seeing yourself not as a doing as what you do but seeing yourself as having value because of the qualities that you yeah. that you have yeah. And that's not a self-centered bootstrapping, yay me mm -hmm. thing. That is honoring God because he says we're fearfully and wonderfully made. And if we believe that, then we would say, you know what, God, you are right. I am. Yeah, I am. And not in a heady way. I am amazed, which the, um, uh, in the message translation in the fearfully and wonderfully made, it's like, it's like, what an awesome creation. Mm -hmm. That's all. What is an awe-inspiring creation? Mm -hmm. And yeah. so, again, not heady, not puffed up. It is just seeing ourselves in light, in the way God sees us, in the way He has crafted us. Yeah, and being amazed. I think. Yeah. Like I'm just in awe. I, you know, I worked in management for a long time before I had kids, and we had four kids in four years. And I remember sitting, my husband had to go through this thing before we went into ministry, and we both had to do these assessments. And I remember sitting in front of that assessor and saying, dude, like I worked in management for a long time, but now I'm just a mom. And I think, I think we only had two kids at the time. And he was like, well, then can I encourage you? The more kids you have, probably the better you'll do. And I was like, oh no, we're good. <laughs> and it's been so true though. I mean, yeah. I, I think I'm much better with four kids than I would have been with two. And I'm not saying that everyone should be or can be, but I just, God wired me as a manager. Mm -hmm. And so with four kids, I've got a bigger team. <laughs> we get more things done, you know? Um, and, and so it, it is, it's really amazing to me to just stop and stand back and be like, okay, God, yeah. you really like, and if we, if we look at those things within ourselves and we give him honor and praise for the way he has crafted us, it does bolster us from being able, from looking at each other and saying, well, you don't understand because you, because we're like, wait, I, this is, this is my story and my, um, this is how tenderly the Lord has crafted me and placed his fingerprint on my story and has engraved my name on his palm is that it is a unique story in this beautiful collective story of hope. Right instead of it being a competitive story right that i can say well i only have i own oh, i i have a son just have a son mm -hmm. so i can't i really don't know what it's like to parent because i only had one kid mm -hmm. right i can't it's like no i had a son and i had a lot of story that was wrapped up into mm -hmm. the reason why i have one child mm -hmm that has gifted me and, and crafted me in ways to be able to respond differently. That will be honestly collaborative Heather mm -hmm. with your story of mm -hmm. being a mom of several kids. Right. Mm -hmm. And our stories will be collaborative again. There'll be that ampersand mm -hmm. if we allow it and right. not allow the, um, and not allow comparison to take root and uh, gosh, my, my friend, Rochelle Parham, she wrote an entire book about comparison mm -hmm. yeah. and she talks about, and boy, you know, there's some comparison that's good, right? Mm -hmm. If we didn't know comparison, we wouldn't know hot versus cold. Mm -hmm. There's, there's good comparison mm -hmm. out there. It's when we get into character quality and mm -hmm. we get into that comparison as, as being a judgment mm -hmm. upon who we are as a person, that it's unhealthy. But if we see yeah. each of us as being made in the image and likeness and for God's glory and that we are all his delight mm -hmm. that he did not he didn't look at any of us and say well that was a mess up never mind I'll, <laughs> I'll try it again yeah um, then we are far more apt to see each other in a collaborative sense and in a collective sense of a greater redemptive story yeah. Yeah. That needs to be told. Well, and I, I love, I love thinking about the fact that if God knows my story and every detail of my story, if He 
planned every detail of my story. Who am I to say, oh, you got that one wrong, God. Mm-hmm. Like I, I didn't really need that part. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, that, that I think is so amazing and hopefully so encouraging to someone watching or listening today because mm-hmm. he does know every detail. There weren't mess ups. It wasn't like, oh, whoops, I didn't know you were going to do that for yeah. five years or whatever. I mean, he knows and he can use that. In, in a beautiful way. Well, Ronnie, we're out of time, but before we go, tell everyone where they can get your book. I'm guessing all the regular places, but tell us the full title because I know it has it probably has a subtitle too, and I'm horrible <laughs> with subtitles. Um, so tell us that and then tell us where we can connect with you. Sure. Uh, the book is One Woman Can Change the World, Reclaiming Your God-Designed Influence and Impact Right Where You Are. And the easiest place for you to learn about every place you can get the book and to be able to download things like a study guide and a discussion guide for small groups or book clubs and things is to go to onewomancanchangetheworld.com. You can also connect with me and that links to my website. So it's all good, but you can connect with me on Instagram. It's Ronnie Rock and it is R-O-N-N-E, R-O-C-K or on Facebook at Ronnie Rock Writes. Great. And I'll put those links in the show notes. So if you're driving, don't worry about writing anything down. <laughs> oh, <do> not. <laughs> you, keep that, you put that blanket forward on and yeah. you walk into that store proudly <laughs> and, and know that everything is waiting for you when you get home. Yeah, you, you are covered. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ronnie, it's been so fun talking to you today. Thank you so, so much, much for your wisdom. And, um, and I am excited for, uh, for people to read this book and to, uh, to hear what they think of it. I think I uh, would love to hear from them too. They can <laughs> write me and I'm a, I love to pray. I love to support. So I'm here for you. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, thanks again, Ronnie. That's all for today's show. And I hope something in this episode has helped you stop comparing and start living. Thanks. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Cheers.